the Great Lakes are unusually warm right now, and that could have some implications for the winter season and beyond. Uh, and uh, here to tell us a little bit about, about how, what implications that may have and, and how organizations such as the National Weather Service predict uh, the f our future weather patterns based on information such as that is Rich Pullman. He is a warning coordination meteorologist at the National Weather Service for Detroit and Pontiac. Rich, thank you for being with us today. Uh, good morning. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you on. So uh, first off, you're a warning coordination meteorologist. Uh, for those that may not know what that is, uh, decode that for us. What does it mean to be a warning coordination meteorologist? Yeah, it sounds like a pretty impressive title. Yes. Uh, basically, I, I get to meet with a lot of our partner groups, whether it's uh, the television uh, meteorologists, uh, government partners, especially in Homeland Security and emergency management, uh, and then also with boaters, pilots, um, schools, and all of our spotters out there that help us during severe weather. I meet with these groups, uh, talk about our operations at the Weather Service and then get their feedback to help improve how we issue our watches, warnings, and day-to-day -day forecasts. And so, uh, and so uh, a report, as I said, came in that the Great Lakes are unusually warm right now and that could have some uh, implications for our winter weather or it could be a, an indicator for what's to come this winter or even beyond that. Uh, just how unusually warm are the Great Lakes at this time and what sort of effects could that have on our weather going forward? Sure, um, at the end of October, we were at or very close to record warmth for that time of year. Uh, as you may have noticed in November, we had quite a bit of cool weather. Um, and so our, our lake water temperature is not at record levels anymore, but we're still in the top one or two uh, highest recorded uh, Great Lakes temperatures uh, since the water temperature started being uh, tracked. Uh, so what that gives us is a lot of uh, heat and a lot of potential energy for and, and moisture for any snows that uh, develop from our lake effect snow process. So as we get the cold air from the winter blowing across the Great Lakes, it allows for more heat and moisture to escape into the atmosphere that lead to those lake effect snow showers. So the greatest impacts are certainly going to be felt from these warmer lakes. Uh, if we get cold air and it'll be closer to the lake, the more likely you'll see those impacts. Here in southeast Michigan, in an average year, we might see a a uh, couple of inches, uh, maybe up to five to eight extra inches of snow because the lakes versus areas that don't have the lakes, like in Wisconsin or farther south in Ohio and Indiana. Given our climate, we might see an extra three to eight inches of snow. This year, if we do manifest the colder air moving over the lakes because there's so much more heat and moisture available, well, we might boost that up a little bit more here in Metro Detroit. So then, Rich, uh, in terms of sustainability of, of these changes, um, because the Great Lakes have been so much warmer than usual, because, as you just mentioned, all those different uh, uh, effects that come from that uh, increased warmth, uh, could that sustain itself throughout the winter? Or at some point, it, would you expect, or could we expect, that the Great Lakes uh, temperature could uh, adjust to more normal to a more normal situation and then that could change the weather patterns in winter or should this be something that we could expect to be pretty consistent uh, as we head into the winter and go through the winter season yeah it's all going to depend on how cold the cold air masses are coming down from canada or maybe alaska or the arctic uh, the more cold air we get, uh, the more the Arctic outbreak uh, cold air that we get, the more likely the lake temperatures will cool off, get closer to normal, and then we might see some ice develop on the lakes. I mean, we always see ice develop on the lakes, but with more heat, it's going to take a lot more cold air to, to um, cool those lakes uh, to get the ice to form. So if we get a lot of cold air, uh, get the average amount of ice, then we'll get more into the average lake effect snow pattern, which generally tends to drop off once we get into February and March, just because there's less open water. Uh, there's not as much heat and moisture that can escape into the atmosphere to generate that. 
Um, there's all all sorts of little um, idiosyncrasies with how the atmosphere works. We can still have a lot of cold air move over the lakes, uh, but if it's a very dry air mass, we won't see as much lake effect because the dry air will help uh, evaporate the moisture that comes off of the lakes. Um, and, and some of the other things that can happen with the warmer lake waters is that the first batches of cold air that move across the Great Lakes are going to be modified quite a bit. The warm lake water will actually warm up the cold air. So places like Wisconsin are always much colder than Michigan because of that warm air uh, surrounding the Great Lakes. It modifies our air temperatures and, and reduces the impacts of the Arctic air masses and cold Canadian air masses that come down across the Great Lakes. We're joined by Rich Pullman. He is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service serving Detroit and Pontiac, joining us on the Megacast. So we know the Great Lakes are warmer. We, we uh, have discussed how, some of the ways that uh, that greater warmth could affect our weather patterns uh, in the remainder of this fall season and heading into the winter and throughout the winter season. Uh, but what are some of the causes, to your knowledge, to, to the National Weather Service, to NOAA's uh, knowledge, what are some of the reasons behind why the Great Lakes are so much warmer than usual right now? Well, we had a, a warm summer. Uh, it was in the top 10 warmest summers uh, on record. Um, and that followed actually a very warm uh, winter. Uh, so w the lakes didn't start off uh, the uh, springtime in 2021 uh, as cold as they normally would have. And so then when you uh, add a top 10 warmest summer on top of uh, a warm lake already, uh, it warmed up to near record levels or at record levels for the fall when we usually get our, our warmest water temperatures right at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall. Uh, and, and we may not have noticed as many 90 degree days, but really where we see the warmth happening is at night. We don't cool off at night, especially in the summer, as cool as we used to. So there is some aspects that are tied back to climate change. This one particular year of 2021 is a little harder to tie back to climate change, but this overall pattern that we've seen in the Great Lakes of warmer temperatures um, and can have, and there are some fingerprints of uh, global warming and climate change that uh, that you can see from that. Rich Pullman joins us on the Megacast, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service serving Detroit and Pontiac. Um, so you mentioned climate change. Does the continuously changing climate and the, and the gradual changes that come with the overall climate change we're experiencing worldwide, is that making it more difficult for you and, and for your other colleagues as meteorologists to uh, predict upcoming weather patterns and where we might be going throughout the rest of this year and into the years ahead? On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and we forecast out for seven days uh, at, at our local office, we have a climate prediction center that will do forecast out for two weeks, four weeks, and then monthly. Um, the day-to-day um, -day forecast, um, you won't see the effects of that climate change, and so the forecast uh, isn't any more difficult than it ever than it always is on a day-by-day -day forecast. It's, uh, there are always challenges to make that forecast out for seven days. Uh, but um, as we look at sort of the longer-range forecast, when our climate prediction center is forecasting for the next year on a month-by-month -month basis. Uh, they are um, using some of that global warming uh, influences and in how, how those climate models that forecast out to a year or, or longer are, are used and implemented in making those forecasts. Uh, and so you see those trends across the nation when the Climate Prediction Center issues a winter outlook uh, like they did uh, just a few weeks ago uh, in mid-November when they issued the official winter outlook. We're joined by Rich Pullman, a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service, serving Detroit and Pontiac, joining us today on the Megacast. And so uh, we, all, we often hear about uh, El Nino versus El, El, uh, La Nina and, and how those uh, occurrences out in the Pacific 
uh, can affect weather, particularly on the western side of the country. But uh, La Nina and El Nino also affect weather here in the Midwest and in the state of Michigan specifically as well. Uh, give us an overview of, of the differences between El Nino and La Nina and the ways that uh, both of those occurrences can affect weather patterns here in Michigan. Uh, sure, uh, happy to. Um, El Nino is when we have warmer than average temperatures off of the coast of South America in the Pacific Ocean, the Eastern Pacific Ocean. The opposite of that is La Nina, which is cooler than water, average water temperatures in the Eastern Pacific. There's also a condition where we have the average and we have those winters uh, as well. Right now we are in a La Nina winter. Uh, this is our second year in a row, which is pretty typical to have two La Nina winters in a row. Uh, and like you said, it affects the West Coast and the South much more than the Great Lakes uh, and the Northeast part of the United States, just because we're farther from the Pacific Ocean. And there are other circulations in the atmosphere around the Arctic, around the North Atlantic that have greater influence on the Great Lakes and Northeast United States. Unfortunately, the Arctic oscillations and North Atlantic oscillations can only be forecast about two to four weeks in advance. So it's a little harder to use that to forecast for the winter or forecast for the entire summer. Whereas California, they can look at what El Nino and La Nina look like, and they know pretty much what to expect for their cold season, their winter season. So for most La Nina winters, uh, what happens is the jet stream gets pushed up into uh, Alaska and uh, Western Canada, and then it usually dives down across the Central Plains and then back up into the Northeast and the Great Lakes. That puts us in the, the storm track uh, and what side of that storm track will determine how cold or how warm we are, but we are gonna be in the storm track so we can expect on average more storms, more precipitation. Some of that will be rain, some of that will be snow. And we'll just have to see uh, which side of those storms we, are, we end up at more often to see if we'll have above or below normal snowfall. We're joined by Rich Pullman. He is a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service of Detroit and Pontiac, joining us today on the Megacast. And so uh, as we continue to see the effects of climate change gradually impacting uh, our weather patterns across the seasons here in Michigan over time, um, knowing that climate change will continue to have an effect on the state, on the state of Michigan and, and on our overall climate here in the U.S. And, and climate all around the world, does that make it tougher for uh, or, or how does that change the way that you and other meteorologists at uh, NWS and at NOAA and other organizations approach uh, trying to predict or anticipate weather patterns over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years and beyond? Yeah, one of the uh, signals with climate change here in the Great Lakes, northern half of the United States and Canada is just more precipitation. And, uh, and the heavy rain days end up being even more pronounced, even more rainfall. And so we kind of saw that this summer, and as a matter of fact, we've seen this uh, uh, through the course of the last 30 to 40 years, that when we get heavy rain events, uh, there's more rain with them. And our infrastructure was designed uh, 50, 100 years ago uh, for a different climate. And so, uh, that precipitation signal in our global warming, our climate change that we're experiencing is probably the most significant for the state of Michigan and especially for urban areas. Uh, and it's something that, uh, you know, we expect to issue more flash flood warnings uh, because of the, the chances of having heavier rain events when those heavy thunderstorm uh, rain events happen. We're joined by Rich Pullman. He is a warning coordination meteorologist with the National Weather Service of Detroit and Pontiac. Uh, Rich, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Uh, anything else that, uh, on the weather front that we should be uh, keeping aware of as we head into the winter season or anything else that we haven't discussed today uh, that you would like to talk about? Well, with winter weather in Michigan, um, you know, we certainly want to pay attention to the big snowstorms. You'll hear a lot about them. Uh, it, there's a lot of talk on television, on radio, between your neighbors when those happen. Uh, but in Michigan, uh, we started talking, out of, uh, talking about lake effect. And so when those lake effect snow showers move across the state of Michigan, 
Uh, they can uh, drop the visibility very quickly. Uh, they can turn a dry uh, interstate highway into one that's snow covered and icy. And this is what leads to a lot of multi-car pileups uh, here in, in the state of Michigan. When you go from that dry pavement, clear visibility to all of a sudden that wall of white, snow covered roads, and you go from 70 to 80 mile an hour traffic down to uh, uh, road conditions that don't allow you to go over 30 or 40 miles an hour. And so we issue a snow squall warning for those type of events. The snow squall warning will be alerted on your cell phones, just like a tornado warning or some of our most significant flash flood warnings uh, through the wireless emergency alert system. And uh, that alerts you to when you're going into that wall of white where the roads are gonna go from dry, uh, high speed type of conditions into those icy conditions. And we're trying to avoid those multi-car pileups. And unfortunately, uh, every year uh, we see those multi-car pileups across the country, uh, uh, are, they end up with fatalities and injuries. And so that's what we're trying to prevent. And so we have a lot of those snow squall issues with these lake effect snows that break off from Lake Michigan and travel all the way here to Metro Detroit. Well, Rich, we thank you very much for your insight, giving us some more information and uh, you know, clearing up some of the confusion that may be there with um, what may be coming in this winter and, and some, some things to expect uh, in terms of the effects of climate change on Michigan's weather and climate in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.